coming up, an Arizona city wants to make it safer for pedestrians, but its plans are to build on top of a Hohokam village believed to be over a thousand years old. Plus, we meet the woman behind the amazing healing story of the moccasins that finally made it home after more than a century. And we have scary indigenous movies for Halloween. Join us for those interviews plus headlines on the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. The ICT Newscast is sponsored by the Indian Land Tenure Foundation, a nonprofit organization serving American Indian nations and people in the recovery and control of their rightful homelands on the web at ILTF.org. Support for the ICT Newscast with Aaliyah Chavez comes from the Arizona PBS Studios in Phoenix at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. Thank you for joining us. I am Aliyah Chavez. We start today above the medicine line with a new report raising lots of questions about an iconic folk singer. A report by the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation has raised allegations about identity fraud regarding singer Buffy St. Marie. The story, Who is the Real Buffy St. Marie, challenges her biography in a number of ways, including her claim that she was adopted as a child and knew little about her family's origins. CBC documented her birth certificate as Beverly St. Marie on February 20, 1941, born to Albert and Winifred Santa Maria. She is the latest public figure whose indigenous ancestry and biography has been challenged both in the United States and Canada. In May, an anthropology professor at the University of California, Berkeley, apologized for falsely identifying as indigenous. Elizabeth Hoover had maintained for decades that she was Mohawk, but now says she is a white person who lived in identity based on family lore. Buffy St. Marie, who is 82 years old, released a statement calling the allegations hurtful and beyond traumatic. She said, quote, I may have been born on the wrong side of the blanket, but that, she said, was her mother's story to tell, not hers. I have always struggled to answer questions about who I am, she said. I may not know where I was born, but I know who I am. She said she was adopted into the Piapot family in accordance with Cree law and customs. That family claims me as their own, she said, and is lucky to have them in her life. Acting Chief Ira Lavely of the Piapot First Nation told the CBC, When it comes to Buffy, we can't pick and choose which part of our culture we decide to adhere to. We do have one of our families in our community that did adopt her. Regardless of her ancestry, that adoption in our culture to us is legitimate. Reporting from Phoenix, Arizona, Aliyah Chavez, ICT News. We should note that the music on the ICT newscast is co-authored by Buffy St. Marie and Tanya Taguk. In Washington, D.C., the newly elected House Speaker Mike Johnson is leading efforts to rescind funding under the Inflation Reduction Act. After Johnson took the gavel, the House started on its long list of action items. One of the 12 appropriations bills, the Energy Water Spending Bill, was passed. It included a $5 billion budget cut from the Inflation Reduction Act, which provided historic funding for green energy projects. The Senate continues to work on its own funding process, likely moving forward with a bill that combines several agencies into one spending bill. The House and Senate must reconcile the legislation that is enacted, and the White House will have to weigh in as well. The House spending bill would cut funding from several green energy initiatives. This includes helping municipalities and states to create climate-resilient building codes and rebates for consumers who buy electric appliances. Speaker Johnson has stated in the past he doesn't believe that climate change is caused by human activities. Moving to Dallas, Texas, where the city is honoring Native people through its own Indigenous Peoples Day. 
Dallas city officials have officially moved to acknowledge the second Monday in October as such. A proclamation was handed to Eli Hickman, a citizen of the Navajo and Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians, after a public round dance. The move comes years after hard work of, from organizers, including activist Jody Voice Yellowfish. We've been living in a state of violence since colonization, and it's never stopped, she told the Dallas Morning News. Both Hickman and Yellowfish have a long history of outreach, including with stickball and MMIW outreach. We turn now to Washington, D.C., where tribal cannabis industry leaders are gathering this week. The Indigenous Cannabis Industry Association is holding its second annual National Indigenous Cannabis Policy Summit. So far, five tribes have joined the organization. It aims to share expertise and resources in what could be a $52 billion industry by 2026, according to the IAIC, and it's a new approach for a new industry. I owe this to my people, and that, that my people means all Natives. So uh, if I can help, I'm going to help. Um, sharing my failures is going to be you know, part of that success. We're all in this together. So I, I love the idea of ICIA bringing us together and sharing and pooling those resources. We're pooling resources uh, that can provide backbones uh, for uh, legal moves um, to exercise sovereignty. Um, and right now, since we're all kind of jumping in the same pool together, Gary has been, been providing mentorship, which you haven't seen in the past. You know, when tribes do something, it's typically in a vacuum. The IAIC's goal is to promote the destigmatization of cannabis and influence policy reform that can aid tribal communities. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. Everywhere you look in the U.S. was once Native American land. That can be difficult to imagine now that whole cities and communities have been built on top of what used to exist. Officials in Arizona tell me they were surprised when they found a significant archaeological village in the city of Tempe. Take a look. The city of Tempe in Arizona is bustling with folks trying to go to and from. This road is one where students and others get to the campus of Arizona State University. Starting in 2010, city planners began a streetscape project to transform this area to create safer bike paths, pedestrian bridges, and directional ramps. Then, everything was put on pause after archaeologists uncovered a small but significant slice of history. Underneath the dirt was once a prehistoric Hohokam village dating back over a thousand years ago to at least the 8th century. The Odham people here built intricate canals to provide irrigation water to local fields. Archaeologists found evidence that they farmed maize, cotton, and squash. The people were traders with pottery pieces found from northeastern Arizona at Black Mesa. Perhaps one of the greatest findings was an exceptionally preserved Vaiki, which is a multi-story building made of adobe. Uh, and that Vaiki uh, was uh, one, of the, one of the key discoveries here uh, that, that the archaeological work yielded. Uh, it was a multi, likely a multi-story building, perhaps two or more stories. Uh, its uh, bottom floor had uh, perhaps at, at least uh, seven rooms to kind of give you an idea of the, of the size of that. And besides uh, housing religious ceremonies, it would have acted as, as something of a community center for the, the villagers that, that lived here. And so uh, that Vaiki, it's, it's really one of only six or so uh, that's been identified uh, in the Phoenix Basin. Tempe's historic preservation officer, Zachary Lechner, told me it was remarkable to find everything so well preserved, not just because of the time and elements they endured, but because there was an early 20th century railroad that ran right on top of this area. But because of the way that the, the grading works for the railroad, it's raised uh, rather than just kind of going against the, the surface and, and obliterating um, that, that key feature, um, it actually preserved it in, in, in place. And so those railroad tracks were removed um, and then, you know, once they, they dug uh, just really several inches below the surface is, is, is when that, that feature was, was encountered. And, uh, and it, was, it, was, it was found to be remarkably well intact. 
The multi-story building is covered up as you can see behind me, and that was done intentionally to respect the site and to preserve it. The city says it consulted with indigenous leaders from the four southern tribes of Arizona. The tribal leaders asked the city to cover the site. Before that, it sent photographers and videographers to capture what was preserved. Doreen Garland, who is Navajo, is the only Native American member of the Tempe City Council. She had the rare opportunity to actually go into the excavation. And so my first time coming here, I got to walk through a room and I looked down and I saw footprints and they were footprints of the people who originally built that and they were a small child's footprints and it just touches your heart to realize you, know, you talk about that this land was um, inhabited by different tribal communities but you, you don't really think about it too much until you see that and you realize that they did live here, they lived here, they loved their families, they raised their crops, they had you know, find ways to get water here. And we saw the, the ways that they did their canals. I mean, you, you hear about it, but until you see it, you don't really actually, I don't, it just touches you differently when you see that. Even though the site has been described using words like significant and culturally important, the city is moving forward with their construction plans on the streetscape project. They are around 95% completed with their designs and held a public outreach meeting on it in mid-October. Chase Wallman is the principal planner for Tempe. He says the project will incorporate what he calls interpretive elements to it. As part of this process, we've been working with an artist um, from the four southern tribes. So what we're um, hoping to do is not only provide this facility functionally um, to get users here, but along the way provide that story of all the archaeological prehistoric significance that occurs along the path. We want to be able to celebrate all of the significance that this has culturally for the four southern tribes, um, as well as still accomplish the goals that we have in transportation for accessibility and comfort. So really it's hand in hand. We're asking them to continually consult us throughout the design and make sure elements such as the interpretive elements um, reflects everything accurately and respectfully. So pretty much it's happening. Yes. Okay. Yes, it is happening. It's been something that the community has uh, awaited a long time. I clarified that the design would not disturb any of the site. Correct. It just would move around it. Correct, yeah. Council member Garland says she supports the plans for the construction. Well, it'll be very welcoming to people who are going to bike or walk along this path. I don't know the, um, the timeline for it right now, um, but I do know that what's going to be nice about it is there are going to be areas that we're going to be able to see when you're biking or walking that will acknowledge what is under the ground that you're walking on so that people can, people can understand what was found there and the importance of that. Up next, the city will choose a company to contract with. The streetscape's final design is expected to be finished in the spring of 2024, with construction starting a few months later in the fall. Reporting from Tempe, Arizona, Aliyah Chavez, ICT News. We did reach out to officials at the four southern tribes of Arizona and did not hear back as of this newscast. Well, a pair of moccasins in South Dakota are once again home. Stripped from a Native American boy more than a century ago at the Carlisle Indian Industrial School, they spent decades in a private collection. Now they are back in their homelands. ICT's Stuart Huntington has more on the remarkable story of the beautiful beaded footwear and the Sisseton Wapiton woman who helped repatriate them. When a native boy arrived at the Carlisle Indian Industrial School more than a century ago, he was stripped of his beautiful beaded moccasins, which were then squirreled away from the school into private hands where they were handed down generation to generation. When John Baker inherited them in 2011, he knew he wanted to return them, but didn't know where they should go. We'll pause now and turn to the story of Kelly Bova, who as an infant was adopted into a white Pennsylvania family from the Sisseton Wapiton Oyate in South Dakota. So in my adoption, I never met another Native American for 50 years. Um, my mom here tried, and she like would take me to a powwow. Temple University had them. They had them in the parks in Philadelphia. But at, at that age, when I was young, I didn't 
I, I didn't want that. I, I just wanted to fit in at that point in my life. So I never, to me, that's like a crime to never meet this, a person who's like you or looks like you for 50 years. And when I, it makes me cry. <laughs> and when I found my family, everything fell into place. And I just dove headfirst and learning as much as I could. She sought out Native community members in Pennsylvania. That led her to join a volunteer cleanup day at Carlisle. I had never been there before, and I never even heard about it, because you don't learn about it in schools. And when I saw those graves, it just really hit, hit me hard. Because I, the, what they said was these children were taken away. They, you know, didn't have, you know, they couldn't learn their language. They couldn't learn their culture, their their hair, none of that, because it was taken away from them, just like it was me, even though mine was adoption. And I did have a great family. I have to say that. I loved my family. I still love my siblings and my mom and my dad and everybody in my family. But when you don't have that part, that's a missing, that's a huge chunk missing out of your life. So when I went there and I saw these graves and then I saw a young girl's grave and her name was Rose. And I knew that was my name when mother gave me when I was born, Rose Ann Owen. And it's underneath it said, um, Sue. And it just, you know, seeing her name and seeing Sue and just seeing that, it just, I just said, I have to learn more. That eventually led her to the Coalition of Natives and Allies, where she was introduced to Baker, who gave her the moccasins. And as soon as I had them, we saged over them, we said a prayer over them, and I just held them like they were a child. You know, like just hold, held them and just, and just said, you're home, you're safe. I'll take care of you. And I brought them home, and I sat them with me in the... I, I don't want to touch them that much because, you know, they're very old. And so I just sat them with me on the, in my office. And I would talk to them in the morning. I would talk to, I, I, to me, it was a young boy. So it's saying, you know, I'd say good morning. I would just, you know, just, just, it wasn't every day, but a lot of time I would just come in and I would just sit with him. Then came the repatriation of a Sisseton Wapiton boy and a Spirit Lake boy from Carlisle this summer. The boys had died at the school in the 19th century. When I heard that they were repatriating um, Amos and Edward from Carlisle, I told Tamara St. John about the um, the moccasins. And I said, I, I think that's a good time for them to go home to. Because these moccasins, even though we couldn't pinpoint a, a young boy who they belonged to, to me, they represented all the children who were taken. Because these, these moccasins traveled from... I'm just going to say from Sisseton to Carlisle, and then we're taken from there. And so in September, Bova took the moccasins back home with the two boys. And now it was like a complete circle, and they were going back again, just like I did 10 years ago. I left Sisseton. I was brought to Rosebud. That's where I thought I was from. And then I was adopted to the Catholic um, Church there. But it was like a huge circle again. And it, that's why I knew I had to bring them back. It was hard for me to let them go because when I had them and I was, you know, talking to them and, but I knew that they had to be, to be brought back. And when I had to let, let give them to Tamara, to Tamara I was crying because it was like letting go a little piece of me. The moccasins now sit in the tribal offices waiting for a formal display case to be built for them because they tell a tale in a way that transcends mere words. When we tell the story, it's just, you know, just words and names. But when you actually see a pair of shoes of moccasins that somebody has worn, a young boy has worn, it really hits you. And another, you know, I try to say, you know, close your eyes and just imagine somebody, a young child in your life, now gone and being taken from you. Reporting from Carbondale, Colorado, Stuart Huntington, ICT News.
We are almost out of time today, but we cannot end our show without wishing you a happy Halloween. In honor of the spooky holiday, ICT's Nick Parks has compiled a list of the scariest indigenous horror movies to watch. Check it out. Slashback follows four teenagers in Nunavut who discover that local disappearances are linked to a shape-shifting alien. Hey, fine! Can we go back to hunting a blood-sucking alien? They have to fight back using their hunting skills to help save their town before more people are killed. Here's a scene. Coming from Marvel Studios is a spin-off from the X-Men universe called The New Mutants. Indigenous actor Blue Hunt plays a young mutant who discovers they have special powers with four others while being held in a secret facility. They must fight to escape their past sins and save themselves. It's hunting us. No, it's hunting Danny. Why Danny? Because that's what she fears. Come on. Come with me. Right, one, two, three. Uh. Take Danny to a safe place. And I'll take care of this bear. Up next is Rhymes for Young Ghouls. The late indigenous director Jeff Barnaby tackles the dark reality of Canada's residential school system and the horrors that some youth face. At the Red Crow Reservation, children are sent to St. Dymphna's where they are at the mercy of the sadistic agent named Popper who runs the school. It's been a long time, Joseph. You know, ever since you've arrived in my fair hamlet, we've had raucous parties, drunk Indians, a car blow up, a grave desecrated. Now we find you out here on the water when you're not supposed to be. If I go on up to the house, I'll be right there. I'm not going anywhere. And one more from Jeff Barnaby is Blood Quantum. When the dead start coming back as zombies outside the isolated Red Crow Reservation, its indigenous people find out they are immune to the virus. They build a fortress where they take a stand against the walking dead and have to decide if they help the outsiders who might still be alive. Here's a clip. <laughs> And from the film series Predator, we bring you Prey. A skilled Comanche warrior has to fight against one of the first predators to ever land on Earth. She must battle the wilderness, dangerous colonizers, and the human hunting alien to keep her people safe. Take a look.
In case you're wondering, the Halloween holiday is getting more expensive. For the second year in a row, the cost of treats has risen by more than 13% from a year ago. We'd also like to wish everyone a wonderful All Souls Day if you choose to observe it. Well, be sure to join us on the next ICT Newscast. A new novel from an Ojibwe author is in bookstores this week. ICT Shirley Snavy talks to Linda Lagarde Grover about her book, A Song Over Misqua Rapids. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private